Okay, good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Jorge Otero Pilos. I'm the director of the Historic Preservation Program here at Columbia. Um, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Annabelle Seldorf, our distinguished speaker tonight. Um, she has built buildings for cultural institutions and universities such as Brown, New York University, the Clark Institute. Her firm has created numerous galleries for David's Werner, Hauser and Wirth, Gladstone Galleries, among others, and designed exhibitions for the Whitney, Fries Masters, Gagosian Gallery, and the Venice Art Biennale. The firm has designed the largest recycling facility and education center in the United States, the Sunset Park Material Recovery Facility, which is located in the Brooklyn waterfront, and you all probably know it. Tonight, Annabelle will be focusing on her designs for and with old buildings. Some of these are very familiar to many of you, the Neue Gallery here in New York. Some may be less so, like the Luma uh, Arles, a new contemporary art gallery uh, center, sorry, in Al, France. You will probably know the Frick Collection expansion here in New York, and you will have read in the papers about her new commission uh, from the World Monuments Fund for the Forbidden City Palace Museum in Beijing. Tonight's lecture honors the memory of Paul Byard. We celebrate his legacy as director of the Historic Preservation Program from 2000 to 2008. And so this year we celebrate the 10th anniversary of this memorial lecture. And just before we started the memorial lecture, Annabelle gave a talk here. So we're both celebrating Annabelle's return to Columbia University and the 10th anniversary of the Bayard Memorial Lecture. And so I want to acknowledge the presence of Rosalie Bayard here, who honors us with her uh, presence every year for the last decade. Um, as both a lawyer and an architect, Paul believed that architecture was an argument rendered in building materials. He thought that just like a lawyer must relearn to read in order to understand the language of the law, and anybody that has gone to court knows that the language of lawyers is not the language that we speak every day, uh, but just like a lawyer had to relearn the English language, an architect had to relearn architecture in order to understand the arguments expressed in old buildings. Now, everyone that knew Paul knew that he loved arguments. You had to sort of like dodge him in order not to get into an argument with him. You never knew when he was going to lure you into an argument. Um, but he was also like what was what was tricky with Paul is that he was a great listener. So whatever you said would be held against you in your argument. So, and this is how he read people's work with old buildings. But actually, when he read other people's work, he was incredibly generous because what he looked for were the positive, um, the positive argument. Uh, he was an incredibly positive person. And he loved arguing with people in that spirit of, of, of learning. And he loved arguing with buildings through his architecture. His book, The Architecture of Additions, could have been called The Architecture of Argumentation. He cherished preservation because it involved making a case for contemporary architecture in relationship to architectural argument. If a historic building was an old argument rendered in building materials, he thought a good work of preservation should allow one to read how contemporary architects respond, negate, or extend the old with their own arguments. And he called this resulting work a combined work. Now, what, it's interesting because one of the things he did not tolerate was ignoring the old building. So just like in an argument, if you're trying to have an argument with somebody and they're ignoring you, that's just the rudest thing. So he just, he would not tolerate that. He wanted the new building to engage with the old building. And he admired architects that could advance arguments that could stand up to the strongest arguments of the past which he saw as the greatest works of architecture. But the interesting thing with Paul is that he didn't think that the strongest argument were the most bombastic arguments. 
the most bombastic expressions of architecture. Sometimes the strongest arguments were the most subtle ones, the most subtle moves. And this is where he would have had high praise for the work of Annabelle Seldorf. Because when Annabelle engages an old building, her arguments are subtle, but they are clear. I had the opportunity to watch Annabelle work up close when we collaborated on the competition to restore Clandon Park, an early 18th century Palladian mansion that burned down in 2015. She'll discuss it in detail tonight. Most of the interior was missing, and a little but four of the exterior walls remained. She focused intently for weeks on reading the building. She asked us all to look closely at the building and eventually concluded that the interiors, the missing interiors, were essential to the argument of the old building. And she proposed to bring those walls and those spaces back with subtle twists. Um, I have to pause here for a moment because Clandon Park burnt down. And we've all heard the news that Notre Dame de Paris is still burning. Um, and this is just the saddest thing. And I know that we all um, share in the grief of, of the Parisians, the French, and, and the Europeans at this, at this great loss. We'll have to see and wait till tomorrow to see just how much of the cathedral is missing. Um, I, I was, this was brought to my attention in the middle of class by a French student in tears. Um, and so, you know, we all, I know, want to cry. Um, but what will we do? What will we do with, with Notre Dame? How will we read the arguments of Notre Dame? And I think this is where the great lessons that Annabelle brings to us are really, really important. At the interview of this competition, the, um, the jury asked Annabelle, uh, well, yes, of course, the plan, but where's the wow factor? And Annabelle just sort of paused and took it in. And she gently took them through the argument of why a Palladian villa was not Palladian unless it had the Palladian plan. And so she argued for that, for restoring that important character-defining feature of the Palladian villa despite the fact that if she had to build a new building, she would have never done that. Now, a lot of the old, the other projects didn't do that. Uh, the other projects preserved the ruin, didn't bring back the plan. So in a way, didn't bring back the Palladian Villa. Now, it was not the first time that she was asked this question. She was very polite when in this interview, because of course we were, we were trying to win the competition, which we didn't, spoiler alert. But um, she was already, she'd already been asked this question in a 2014 interview for Gentle Woman. And she answered this way. Well, if people say to me, where's the wow factor? I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I hate that. It's not about wowing someone. It's about and I'm going to let her answer that tonight. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Annabelle Selby. What can I say? Wow. Um, that was very funny. <laughs> I don't remember any of those things. Uh, just like I don't remember the title of this lecture. Um, it's incredibly nice to see you all here, see many friends. Uh, Lectures are intimidating, I think, um, but I brought so many photographs that uh, if I forget what to say, there are pictures to look at. And so without further ado, I just want to tell you a little bit more uh, beyond that which uh, Jorge has already said. I think that was basically enough. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about uh, who we are Seldorf Architects, um, is, lives on Union Square, we're some 74 people today. Um, three of my incredibly fabulous partners are here, um, and many of the people from the office are here, 
of course they are late because they're too busy. They're just sitting down now. Um, but it is an incredibly nice place. Everybody is smart, everybody collaborates, uh, and I couldn't, if, the office and the people there are what I am most proud of uh, with everything we're doing. And so, you know, a little bit about uh, offices in New York City, but I very rarely talk about where I am from. I am German, undoubtedly you've figured that out by now. Um, I was born not in 1930, a little bit later. <laughs> But this is what Cologne looked like in 1930. Cologne is famous for its beautiful Gothic cathedral, round about the same time as Notre Dame, and um, is a city that was built uh, in a Roman grid, and it goes way back. This is what it looked like in 1930, and this is what it looked like in 1944. It is one of the cities in Germany that was more destroyed than many other cities. Um, fortunately, the cathedral was left relatively unharmed, but it has been a site of construction, I think, since the beginning. So when you look at all this destruction, um, you learn something about me. I was born in 1960, and so as a post-war person, all we grew up with in <laughs> when I was young was learning about the Second World War. Um, feeling responsibility, feeling guilt, shame, feeling um, tired of guilt and shame, and dealing with destruction and loss of our own families, loss of so many lives, and loss of so many monuments. And that goes into one's bones, into one's DNA, I would say. Um, I didn't know that, of course, then. <laughs> this is what I really grew up with. This is the beautiful Cologne that I knew, hastily rebuilt in uh, post-war era with sort of modernist 1950s um, fairly unattractive architecture. But there is the cathedral and um, and there you see some of the contradictions. My own home uh, was in a family of architects and designers. My father was an architect, not by training, but by, um, by experience. And this is the home that we lived in when I was a little kid. Uh, it was built on top of the shops where all of the, of the work, mostly interiors, was done. So on the lower floors were <clears throat> a metal shop and, and a carpentry shop and so on and so forth. And we lived in the area that you see there, which is illuminated. And very proudly, my father built in the early 70s this very cool loft-like space um, that was completely unusual in Cologne. It was the penthouse. Um, I saw those pictures just a couple of days ago, and it was so funny because I hadn't thought of that space in I don't know how many years, but I sort of feel like I want to tell you about that painting that's on the wall and oh there's that sculpture that was made by a friend of my father's but in some ways I think it illustrates a kind of um, aesthetic disposition that um, you then find again in the prefab house that the family <laughs> moved into uh, in the later 70s and that is um, my late father's house until today. All right, fast forward, um, or not so fast. I then came to New York, studied at Pratt Institute, and later uh, got my master's from Syracuse in, um, in Florence, and started my own practice very early. Uh, and 
one of the most <laughs> wonderful projects fits into this into this lecture in as much as Venice is all about restoration, isn't it? Uh, a client of mine had uh, fulfilled his fantasy and bought this palazzo that was in terrible shape uh, when he bought it and he promptly hired an engineer architect because he, my client, knew absolutely everything about restoration, renovation, preservation. It was meant to become a foundation for contemporary artists and um, for some reason or another, I spoke a little bit of Italian, still do, and uh, so my client said to me, you speak Italian, you come here and you help me with this. And so that's what I did. And my Italian improved considerably over the next three or four years that I was working on this. Uh, and I went, it went as far as learning to speak Venetian, or not so much speak, but understand. And everything was a problem. Everything was the soprintendenza didn't want this, and the soprintendenza didn't want that. And um, if you did want to do something, it would just cost twice as much, and so on and so forth. But without going into an incredible amount of detail, I think it's worth noting that this is a typical Venetian palazzo, that uh, early days I think early, uh, earliest dates back to about 1300, and it was added uh, to through the centuries, through all the way, like the railing that you see in this at the windows is definitely 19th century, obviously. So there is a composite, and if I started by telling you what was there and what wasn't there, uh, it would take a very long time. But suffice it to say that I had the presence of mind to understand that certain elements that you needed for structural reasons somehow or other had to fit into everything. And so I will never forget that when we put this new uh, beam into the courtyard that um, we sort of initiated this carved uh, carved detail, and I thought to myself, I'm a modern architect, I don't do stuff like that. Um, but, but it was right, and, um, and I remember just walking around and finding evidence uh, for the things that supported one's theory. So this was a very comprehensive renovation, and um, and there is a new real terrazzo floor on the floor. Um, we we uh, repaired the beams that probably at one time were painted, uh, but sort of just brought them back to a simple color. There's a kind of plaster on the wall that the plasterers didn't think was quite fancy enough. We used a calce rasato, rasata as opposed to a marmorino. I'm looking at Sandra, who's looking very, very uh, serious. So I'm terribly worried that I'm saying the wrong thing. But be that as it may, um, every aspect of this house was redone, and always redone with people who locally made things. I can't begin to tell you the conversations about the windows and the colors of the glass and how thick uh, would the frame be. And, and I think, for me, this was one of the nicest experiences about being and working in Venice, is the constant dialogue with the craftsmen. And they were people who were happy to teach me and happy to also sometimes um, what do you call it when somebody makes you trip? Um, but anyway, uh, in the end, this building turned out to be an, a really <laughs> phenomenal space that um, I'm very attached to. Here are some details, like for example, this little kitchen space had uh, remnants of, of a decorated painted ceiling, and bringing a contemporary ceiling into it, making kind of layers of interventions, um, really taking a great deal of pride in every aspect of the interior furnishings. And obviously, my client was an art dealer, so he was a collector himself. 
and, um, and was very involved with every last finish and every last thing. And the finishes that you find in, in Venice, uh, if not in Italy at large, are of course what gives one a great deal of pleasure. So finding this Cipollino um, material in large slabs on the bathroom together with a slightly outlandish terrazzo was an insertion in an old palazzo that was obviously incongruous but made a certain amount of sense because because it was clear that it wasn't an original. And we reclaimed the attic space in order to create um, a kind of exterior terrace, which is one of the cherished things in Venice, is to have an open roof terrace. And the color was, uh, the yellow color was taken um, to sort of an extreme, the Soprintendenza wasn't so keen on having an intense yellow, but eventually we were able to prove that it had been there at one time. So, um, so that was a long project and one I cared about a great deal. But then again, um, one cares a great deal about everyone's project. And uh, so eventually, fast forward, to 1997 or 8, um, we started working on the project for the Neue Galerie, the Museum of German and Austrian Art in uh, New York. It's a 1914 Carrere and Hastings building that was a mansion for a merchant. Um, Andrew Miller, I think, was his name. Miller, anyway. Was it Andrew? I can't remember now. But it had been uh, property of the Evo Institute and had been treated fairly badly because on the upper floors the building served as document storage of, um, of uh, Third Reich documents. And, and so happily by the time I was uh, commissioned, those documents had left the building. But um, it's a beautiful Beaux-Arts building, and little by little we restored, renovated, and ever so slightly modified the, the building. It became a museum when it wasn't equipped to be a museum. We inserted uh, HVAC, lighting, and any number of uh, egress issues. In fact, we're still working on the CFO. But um, it's true. Um, so, what's there to tell? Uh, whenever I go today to the Neue Galerie, I think uh, that it is interesting how one's memory plays tricks on oneself, because I can't remember very well anymore which is really old, which we said belongs to the old fabric, and, well, I guess the new part, you can, even I can identify that. But uh, just quickly about the building itself, it's very interesting. It has this very deep skylight uh, right in the middle of it, which uh, brings, which makes you circulate to the second, to the public floor, and then uh, steps away to circulate on a rear staircase to the upper floors. And this thing, this simple gesture of distributing light in the building is something that I think is, is very unique and really very, very beautiful. On the ground floor, we restored what was at one time a reception into, a, uh, into an Austrian cafe. And you can see that the furniture is all Loos furniture and uh, the sort of side-by-side -side of a turn of the century, or 1914, with Austrian uh, uh, furniture of roughly the same time is always a sort of very interesting thing. And that's what this museum is all about, of course. German and Austrian art uh, no later than 1945. So the existing uh, library was turned into a bookstore, and um, here you see the skylight that we uncovered and see how beautiful the light uh, filters through the building. I think one of the most difficult things to do in the building was to direct the HVAC system in such a way that it was as little uh, visible as possible. Everything else sort of 
um, explained itself. But here, just one little picture to uh, make you understand what things looked like when we first started working on the building. And so the main room, which was the music room where the uh, famous Klimt portrait is today, uh, is where we made a sort of fairly dramatic change, a dramatic intervention in the ceiling, uh, where we inserted not as you might think, no, I know you don't think, that uh, it's not a skylight, obviously, but it's just a ley light. And it sort of in one fell swoop takes a little bit of the domestic feeling out of this room and uh, introduces a kind of different atmosphere. And here is the um, adjacent paneled room where most of the decorative arts are shown. I could talk all day long about you know how we figured out the lighting and what the theory behind the white ceiling was with um, with this sort of concealed ring of, of acid edged uh, panels and then the top floor where all of the uh, temporary exhibitions are was the one floor where there was really very very little original detail left and where we were allowed to create a kind of stage really uh, for different kinds of exhibitions. This picture is the first exhibition and is the only one where these windows ever were open, and it's the only one where uh, the walls were white. Undoubtedly, you have seen many of the exhibitions since then, and they usually are very different. But this is my favorite one for perhaps obvious reasons. <clears throat> I just thought that in order not to only talk about old buildings, additions, renovations or restorations. I quickly wanted to show you a building um, that we did a few years ago for David Swerner, a gallery on 20th Street in New York's Chelsea district, um, a gallery building that's entirely um, board form concrete uh, with punched windows and a sort of open facade, as you can see. And the idea was that a five-story building wraps itself in an L shape around a central um, large gallery space that's approximately 80 feet by 80 feet by 18 feet high with all north-facing skylights. Um, being that it's a new building, uh, David Swerner wanted to be sure that it's an efficient building. It's the first um, commercial gallery that is um, gold LEED certified and it has every um, bell and whistle a LEED certified building needs but I, am, I really believe that what is interesting about it is that the sort of um, the sustainable features if one can use that horrible term uh, are really practical they promote cross ventilation, they promote daylight, they promote the staircase, they promote um, riding your bicycle, not in the building, however. <laughs> and so here is a detail of, of the, of the uh, uh, facade. And I'm showing this because when you make a building uh, out of board form concrete, you get terribly worried when once you have started because all of your colleagues are going to say, are you bloody mad? Nobody does concrete buildings in New York. Um, how are you going to control that? Well, we learned a great deal from the wonderful concrete expert, Reg Hoff and his team. And we learned to follow the recipe for board form concrete very carefully and teach our contractors very carefully that they had to do every mock-up and take every amount of time and everything step by step. And still, it was a period of some 12 months when the building was entirely scaffolded. And um, we were sweating bullets. I'm looking at my partners here who were sweating with me. Um, to f we were sweating bullets for the day when the scaffolding finally came off and actually the entire facade looked like it was fairly compatible. And here is that large 
exhibition space that the building was really designed for. And um, I by now feel a little bit embarrassed when I repeat how proud I was that when Richard Serra, who you see exhibiting here, um, came to the opening of his show and he sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said, it's a good building. <laughs> it does feel like pretty much as good as getting a gold medal for something. I mean, gold lead is one thing. Richard Serra telling you it's a good building is another. But this building really is terrific for art. Uh, there are many different uh, and interesting exhibitions and the people who inhabit the building uh, really take care of it. And I think that is one of the key things, of course, is that you build buildings that are for people and that people who live there accept them as part of their responsibility. The building, of course, is by and large a concrete structure with the exception of the, of the roof of the large space. And so we wanted to give some expression to the concrete and indeed a skylit uh, staircase that winds itself over five floors is something that really uh, makes for a pretty spectacular stepping experience. People go up and down that staircase and get their iPhones out to make sure that they have their 10,000 steps. <clears throat> but in closing about this building, I just wanted to say that there are many different kinds of spaces. We've really explored different kinds of daylight, different kinds of materials, and really with um, all of the of the integrity that I feel we put into designing a building that was solid and uh, well proportioned, well lit, etc. Uh, it is a building that's in the service of art. I was lucky to um, spend more time in Venice, uh, this time for a very different kind of project, uh, Stanza del Vetro on the island of San Giorgio in Venice is a small museum that's dedicated to the art of modern glass. And there, tiny, in red on the left-hand side, you see where San Giorgio is. It's the famous place where there is that beautiful Palladio church that you can see from Piazza San Marco. Um, and one thinks of old buildings in Venice, but here is a 1950s um, school building that was still, uh, despite, despite its relatively modest uh, character, was heavily um, landmarked or um, under the, the uh, auspices of the Superintendenza of Venice. And so we were able to work with the Pentagram Foundation and the Fondazione Cini, who uh, sort of have ruled the island of San Giorgio. Uh, we were able to create a small museum space that is inside this former school building. On the outside, there was very little that we did other than add a small ramp and on the inside, there was very little that we could do to defy the sort of classroom structure uh, that you can see here. So our intervention was really just trying to leave the structure in place and create a series of exhibition spaces uh, that in a sort of serial kind of uh, space go literally around the perimeter. And um, so it's not a spectacular space, but it's a very elegant space. And somehow or other, daylight enters it. Um, and every aspect of it is so nicely done. And my early experience of working with Venetian craftsmen um, came back to, to uh, to be a total pleasure. Uh, many of the people that I had worked with 15 years earlier were still around, and um, so it was a lot of fun to develop the space and work with the curators on, on the exhibition design, but also on some of the permanent vitrines that you can see 
around here. In particular, I like to point out the ceiling fixtures, these beautiful glass eggs um, that my friend Alessandro de Santillana uh, designed, and I salute him because he recently died. And uh, so every time I look at this, I think about how fantastic those collaborations were. Um, here are some more pictures of, of vitrines that we designed in a taller, in a, in a larger space, and um, there it is. Back in New York City, um, we've been spending a lot of time with our friends from Bayer Blinder Bell to work on the um, Frick collection in New York. And when I talk about it, I almost always feel like saying, don't be afraid, we're not doing anything terrible. <clears throat> All of you who know the Frick and know it well, um, of course, everybody thinks, no, it's my Frick. I know what it should be like. Don't do any harm. Um, but not doing any harm was really what we set out to do from the get-go. Um, earlier today, I talked uh, with some colleagues here about what do you how do you feel about a building like that? How do you know what you can do and what you cannot do? I think to begin with, you have to know um, the morphology of one such building. And you may or may not remember that the original house, that house where Henry Clay Frick lived until 1919 from 1914 when the building was finished, was designed by uh, Thomas Hastings of Career and Hastings, old friends of mine. So <clears throat> when he died, and after his wife died as well, um, which was, I think, in 1930 or something like that, um, John Russell Pope was selected to convert the building effectively into a museum. And in the process, um, he had to he had to perform considerable changes. And I don't know that it is useful to tell you every last thing. But I think it is very interesting that one of the things that Pope did is he kind of closed the space where there used to be a port cochere. And he created a new entrance. And all of that, when people go through the building today, they, can, they don't identify as two separate buildings. It's interesting to know also that they were roughly contemporaneous. So where certainly, if you look carefully, you can understand that which is Carrere and Hastings or Thomas Hastings in collaboration with Henry Clay Frick. And then what John Russell Pope did later on um, to turn the building into a public museum. So among other things, um, they created this little entrance pavilion. This is where the garden court is. And then uh, Pope took away a library, a small library that had actually been added to the property um, a little bit later. Here it says 1924. Um, that building was taken down, and John Russell Pope built that tall library building that you may or may not have been into on 71st Street. It's really important to understand that the two buildings, the collection and the library, are one institution. They don't function as that today, um, but the Frick uh, Art Reference Library is one of the foremost <laughs> art libraries in the world and um, is rarely given its due. As a piece of architecture on the street, on the Upper East Side, I think it is one of the most spectacular buildings. And I think it is a real testament to Pope's genius that what he did when he laid out the museum is he extended an already long facade and made it that much longer to punctuate it with that tall building. So, then nothing happened for a very long time. 
It's also important to understand that that which you think of as the um, the original garden was, of course, not a garden, but was the site for some three townhouses that existed there. Um, and little by little, the Frick uh, purchased these three townhouses and tore them down one after the other. And eventually, in 1973, created, 77 actually, um, created the uh, garden with, oops, one more moment, uh, created a new reception hall and these three walls by um, Bailey Van Dyke and Polar and hired uh, Russell Page, the English landscape designer, to do the garden. So that garden, of course, became the controversy when in 19, not 1914, 2014, um, the Frick uh, had attempted to, to add and extend their building and build in the garden. It's not so surprising that they did that because that is why they had purchased those sites in the first place. Be that as it may, um, there were a lot of New Yorkers who were very unhappy about it and I think in a really extraordinary um, attitude they, the board of the Frick uh, decided to withdraw their, uh, their project and think again. And that was, I think, lucky for us um, because we were hired to do the next generation um, of this extension and renovation. And very quickly you start thinking if they what are their needs and how do we realize these needs? Uh, there's practically no space to add if you can't add uh, in the garden. And having said that, I actually agree that the garden is a really beautiful thing and it produces something that beyond the garden design is really important. It makes it a freestanding building, at least on that side. And so what can you do? In short order, um, what you see outlined here in light gray is where we are proposing to add. And all of those spaces are very much dedicated to making a better circulation, serving users, serving the art, uh, and creating an ensemble that makes the entire uh, experience not something that is foreign, but something that is um, inevitable and, and easy. So here are a few pictures of some of the most spectacular rooms and um, they will remain unchanged. So I don't need to dwell on these for too long. But um, it's one of the things that we're very excited about, of course, is that we're going to make um, the second floor accessible for visitors. And if you've ever had the experience standing down on the ground floor uh, wanting to go upstairs, well, that's going to be possible. And uh, it is indeed very exciting. The uh, private quarters of the Frick family are quite different in scale and will be very suitable for um, a much expanded collection of decorative arts and paintings and drawings and um, all of these things are not possible to view today. And here is a picture of the library. It's free and open to anybody who wants to come visit and is a sort of interesting building because it's really just the third floor that is a public space in the building now. Um, but it gives us an opportunity in the expanded program to bring the library together and bring a kind of public face to the library. There will be a study center on the ground floor. Um, there is a small lift on the second floor of the existing reception hall. And the, here is what you see, the expansion of the rear of the library, which doesn't have a very glamorous facade today because it was never meant to be seen, being that it was hidden by the uh, townhouses. And then a, oops, sorry, one more. Um, and then a second aspect of the, of the expansion that is held by what we call a link, 
And that link happens at the intersection, um, or rather at the corner where the garden and the, uh, where the library and the collection meet. And it is that one little moment where there is an element of transparency there. And I'm very excited about that because despite the fact that I think our, our edition stands back and certainly doesn't uh, overpower the existing beautiful buildings, I think this is an opportunity to not be too shy about it and not just say we're not doing anything. No, this is a building that is now in the 21st century more committed to education, more committed to the art, and more committed to the public service that it renders. So all of the beautiful things, making the building accessible to the public um, with ramps, etc., cetera, uh, and providing um, in a very careful way, um, I think is something that is really very special. So I've talked too long on that one slide, but here quickly you see that all that which is red is the existing uh, space open to the public. We're slightly uh, opening the existing reception hall by removing uh, the bookstore from there, creating a connection to the second floor and dedicating a lot of the ground floor uh, in the library to a study center and education spaces. Connecting the existing exhibition space with special exhibitions over here, um, it's been very cumbersome for, for the museum to have to always remove permanent hangings of their art uh, when there are exhibitions. And exhibitions are necessary so as to relate the permanent collection to sort of a wider perspective on art. <coughs> And I just wanted to show you quickly a section that kind of makes it clear how uh, the, the expanded lobby allows us to move um, easily up to the second floor if you can't take the staircase and connect you to the galleries in the old house in a very discreet and very simple way, um, but also connect you down to a new auditorium that is below the restored garden. So <clears throat> all of this is a lot of very finicky work and um, I'm really very pleased to being given the opportunity to spend a lot of time on working out every last detail um, and working with an incredible team of, of experts and colleagues. And here, just quickly, a few pictures that show you that the existing entry basically remains unchanged. We're opening one arch that connects you to the reception hall, which you see right here. And what you also see there is the staircase in the background and the connection to uh, special exhibitions and, and um, eventually the study center. It's also important to know that when you find out how much this garden matters to people and when you make a commitment to restoring um, a garden by Russell Page, that you have to really learn what that means. And, um, and we've been put through the paces, I will say. <laughs> it's taken us, it was a learning process and it's something that, um, I feel like that was a lesson to be learned. We are completely committed to making that garden just as good as it ever was and maybe even a little bit better uh, with healthier plants and um, better uh, support. And the reason why I'm also showing this is because you have to understand that that garden isn't just a garden, it's a roof garden. It's a roof garden that sits atop a three-story excavated space that was the art storage and conceived as a bunker. So effectively what we're doing when we're placing a new auditorium underneath the garden is we're able to uh, create a solid base for for the the planting and the and the roof but it also uh, utilizes space that already exists underneath. 
And this is a perspective of the garden that very few people see, mostly ducklings when they come and uh, spend their summers there. Um, but just to exhibit that the, um, that the second floor of the existing reception hall is indeed very discreet and, and hardly visible, certainly very hardly visible from the, from the street. Another thing that we felt very strongly about is that there is a visual connection from within the library all the way through to the garden. So that the new renewed purpose of the educational spaces is reinforced by, um, by everything from accessibility to a uh, transparent entry, etc. An image of the uh, of the special exhibition, which is adjacent to the to the permanent exhibition, and so the kind of um, continuous loop is something that's very important. So I'm going to try and speed it up a little bit. I know I talk too much, so this is what that looks like. But now we're traveling to France um, to the uh, Luma Foundation in Arles. And what's interesting about that is that it was at one time a um, factory for train cars by the SNCF, abandoned in the early 50s, uh, changing with the abandonment of it, uh, changing the economic structure of Arles completely. Arles has become in, instead a summer touristy place and this is what it looked like when it was a big old factory. Once it was abandoned, um, the Rencontre, the photo festival uh, that you may have heard of, came once a year to inhabit the, um, the uh, degrading buildings. And we are now uh, working with the Luma Foundation and turning it into um, a vibrant art center where uh, experimental <coughs> exhibitions and uh, performances, music, uh, all sorts of things can happen. And our work, the work that Seldorf Architects is doing, is really to revitalize these buildings, to take advantage of the structures that this is what they looked like before we got there, um, <coughs> and to sort of work alongside of Frank Gehry's uh, new building, which sort of sits atop a, the boulevard. So this is the Gehry building, which is coming out of the ground. It's not just coming out of the ground. It's nearly finished. Um, and is a sort of very spectacular antidote to the, to the round uh, open theaters. In the in the old part of town, so these red uh, elements there are the buildings that we've been working on, and rather than giving you a lot of information on the various uh, climate changes, skylight changes, lighting, uh, etc., I'll just show you a couple of pictures. That black part of the building is something that we added, uh, as if the buildings weren't big enough. Well, they really weren't big enough because there wasn't uh, enough space that was column free. And so we added one segment and restructured that so as to create large open space that's versatile in any number of ways. And in working with the local landmarks ordinance, uh, it became very clear that they were interested in, uh, in the idea of repeating the shape which seemed like the logical thing to do, but that they did not at all want it to look like the original building. And so uh, little by little, we sort of developed this idea of materiality that is really a very basic one. Essentially, we chose um, a charcoal colored uh, cement block and uh, laid it very carefully. And if I say so myself, I think it's really very elegant and, and very nice in, in this ensemble. 
And this is what those spaces look like uh, inside. They're very versatile, as I said already. There is, this is the Atelier Luma, where um, a group of peoples come together to sort of develop materials that are um, uh, are repurposed materials from waste of um, agricultural materials. And here is one of the art spaces. <coughs> Together with um, Bas Smeets, the landscape architect from uh, Belgium, a park uh, is going to be developed around all of these buildings. And so in many ways, I think one of the most fantastic things about this project is its truly civic outlook on affording something for the people who live in Arles or who come and visit to come together and think about art and think about um, their existence <laughs> or just frolic in the park. Um, one other building that you see in the distance there is the uh, refectoire, which is uh, a slightly different architectural, has a slightly different architectural presence. Um, and we repurposed this into, um, into a rehearsal space with an, uh, with an internal dormitory of two stories. Why did we do that? Because the buildings were very high and the spaces were very large. And so I'm quite excited about the fact that on the ground floor that was five meters tall, we were able to fit in a two-story CLT um, wood uh, structure, a house within a house that produces really uh, very nice dormitories, small. These are, this is the uh, rehearsal space for the dancers, and here they're actually dancing. Just a couple of pictures of a sort of slightly uh, different kind of architectural language for the dormitory space, and um, here are some images of that. So <clears throat> we're going back and forth uh, from America to Europe, from Europe to America now, um, very quickly, San Diego, a completely different uh, type of project, or uh, a different period, rather. Uh, this is the Museum of Contemporary Art in La Jolla. Um, the original building was uh, an Irving Gill private house that, on, uh, at, with the death of Ellen Scripps, uh, became, was dedicated to a museum, or initially an arts club. And uh, this building has experienced a great many changes in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, the architects Mosher and Drew uh, added an auditorium, added art space, added any number of things that um, then were used in the manner in which it was used until um, Venturi Scott Brown was hired to sort of create a connecting element, and that is what you see here. What they weren't able to do is they weren't able to uh, give additional gallery space to the museum. And when we were hired in a competition, um, the board asked us to find ways of adding space to, to the museum for art exhibition and gallery space. Now, what made that possible, of course, was the fact that they acquired additional space, and um, that space to the south is where we are currently working on expanding the museum. Here is a view to the south. Um, the museum has an absolutely spectacular um, uh, orientation because to the south you overlook the ocean and um, it has a very sort of um, interesting jumble of volumes that uh, is what you see here. So this is part of the Venturi um, uh, edition where this is Mosher and Drew and back here added to the back of the Irving building is also Mosher and Drew. And then this garden, I think, happened over the years. 
Uh, I think that is not Venturi. I think that's pre-Venturi, but Venturi um, added this terrace over here. So it was a very complicated uh, layout, and in addition to it, it is located on a very steep hill. And so in a sort of simplified uh, version, what you see here is all that which is green is the existing building and remains uh, pretty much unchanged. The red is the converted auditorium, and the blue is where we're adding space. One of the issues with um, the existing entrance was that it is now very far away from where the galleries are and um, had become sort of difficult for people to identify being that uh, the facade of the restored uh, Gill building was uh, obscured by a pergola over here that required you to hang a right to get into um, a, a building part that is called Axe Line Court um, that is part of the Venturi edition. So what we're proposing is an entrance that is um, sort of, whoops, more visible from the street over here, retaining axe line and the sort of circulation elements that exist already in their entirety, and instead focus on creating a new entrance and new uh, gallery space over here that then cascades down the hill, um, allowing you to uh, reach a lower level, but also always trying to make sure that the connections back to the old building this over here is, of course, the old auditorium, um, so that these connections back and connections with vistas to the ocean um, are, are well considered. The idea here is that it is a long distance you have to take, you have to walk, but that always you can find ways to reorient yourself and to understand where you are appreciating the really spectacular light and views um, that you can af be afforded from there. And here are just a couple of images. This is a picture of Axe Line Court, which remains really unchanged. Um, and a picture of the uh, original Irving Gill building with Venturi to the right and to the left. And here is a picture of the entrance to the museum with the facade of the of the auditorium being really unchanged. It was a simple box that is just very, very plain, and um, we're happy to leave it that way. <coughs> there is a uh, an interesting uh, daylit gallery space that happens at the intersection of different geometries because the geometry of the site is very complicated. And eventually, uh, looking at uh, the whole thing if you were a bird. So <clears throat> I think that what we are doing is actually stitching these interesting geometries and making something that feels very disparate and very um, sort of unloved from the, from, the, uh, from the ocean side into something that is much more inviting, that brings people back into the museum from uh, the lower coast uh, road and sort of creates an overall circulation around the space with a much more civic-minded uh, attitude toward the town surrounding it. So, <clears throat> Back to Europe. <laughs> uh, this is the competition that Jorge had already talked about, and he already explained what has happened. It was a competition for the restoration, renovation, repurposing of this mansion from the 1720s by um, Giacomo Leone, an Italian architect who found his way somehow or other to England and uh, who had produced this Palladian-style villa. This is what the building looked like, 
And when it was built originally, it sat on a 500-acre parcel of, uh, of land that belonged to the Onslow family. And this was the most spectacular so-called marble room um, that made this building a little bit famous. Oftentimes, concerts were held there, and the building became part of the National Trust in 1956, and um, had not much of a collection. Overall, over time, people had given things from various different houses, and um, so it was more a delight to see from the outside. And sadly, um, especially today, it seems odd to talk about it, uh, the building caught fire and um, burned down to all the way down. It is actually incredibly shocking when you are in the building and there is a sort of scaffolding that al allows you to go all the way to the, to the top and um, see what it looked like. So Jorge has already explained a little bit uh, what the conversation was all about. And I don't want to speak about this for a very long time, mostly because we didn't win. Um, but no, seriously, just because it is such a long conversation about how do you deal with a house like that. I didn't think that the right thing to do would be to say, you restore the ground floor to its former splendor and say it's all the same, which theoretically is possible. Um, and then upstairs have a contemporary multi-purpose space. Um, instead, what we thought is, as Jorge has already said, we would retrace the steps of what made the architecture a piece of architecture and gently introduce different kinds of functions, different kinds of activities in the building, but always thinking of the building as a single organism that had some kind of integrity, that had some kind of coherence, and that were, was never in discord with um, a contemporary attitude. And indeed, that is probably very little wow factor there, although, we were fairly wowed by it. And I must say, um, just quickly here, this uh, picture indicates what the uh, site is today and what it used to be at one time. Uh, we worked with the eponymous <coughs> landscape architect, Gunther Vogt, on, on the design. And their attitude, much as our own, was to sort of find subtle ways of making it a public building and making it into something um, that is generally welcoming and, and, uh, and agreeable on all levels. So I could talk about this for a long time, but I'm just not going to. Uh, only send you, a, show you a couple of beautiful images that were a lot of work. And um, because indeed we made uh, good use of the, of the lower floor for all of the public and hospitality functions. And, um, but in particular, I want to show you um, that our attitude with this marble room was one where Jorge very clearly argued that you can't just re-plaster everything, but instead had the brilliant idea to reveal where loss had been and in very subtle ways reuse some of the, uh, at times, the, the ashes, really. Right? So this was going to be Phoenix out of the ashes, but um, it didn't happen. And so there to the right, you see a rendering of how we thought we might create a new uh, separate circulation, um, <coughs> circulation spine uh, in this dramatic uh, whole of a building. And so now, at the very end, I will just flip through very quickly a project that we're working on currently. Um, we are privileged to have been invited to participate in uh, designing a visitor or an information center for the Tsinlong Gardens in the Forbidden City. 
what you're looking at here, of course, is the big entrance at the Forbidden City and the many layers and many beautiful, incredible details uh, that you encounter when you're um, going to the Forbidden City. <coughs> it was one of those experiences that I found strictly overwhelming. And it's pretty interesting to think that this um, is this this was created in the 1770s. So that the kind of uh, overlaps in time where you're 1720 in Clandon, uh, at Clandon House, and then encountering um, the, the uh, Tin Long Gardens in the Forbidden City. So the Forbidden City is going to, to celebrate their 500th birthday next year. But this little part here, the Tsin Long Gardens, um, came into being in the 1770s as a sort of retirement um, uh, garden for the emperor Pu Yi. And uh, it's a garden that consists of four courtyards, and not all of them are available to the public. Um, the second garden is going to be the one where this information center happens. You have to imagine that everybody in China, anybody in the world can go and wants to go to the Forbidden City. But it's so enormous and it's so difficult to sort of find your way around it um, that from time to time you want to rest and you want to sort of understand what happens. World Monument Fund has uh, for a long time worked very closely with the Palace Museum in teaching uh, and, and dialoguing about um, restoration techniques, not just restoration of architecture, but specific surface restoration of some of the really incredible um, materials and surfaces used. <clears throat> There are 27 pavilions in the forecourt garden, and three of the pavilions in this second courtyard, the West Hall, the Main Hall, and the East Hall, are going to be dedicated uh, to this information center. For us, one of the things that was particularly important is to always uh, be sure that you understood how it relates to the whole. The scale is very different there, and um, and uh, so when you are coming from the main areas in the, in the Forbidden City and you enter the, the gardens, there, the scale changes completely. There are small pavilions. And, um, and to observe the restoration work is simply stunning. Uh, there is a level of craft and, uh, and sophistication in how the work is being done that is really fascinating. Our attitude was to sort of divide the, exib the information center into areas of um, where people can understand what the structure of the architectural pavilion, the architectural structure of the pavilions is, um, and build a model of the entire garden so that you can always orient yourself. This is a 19th century architectural model, one of many that are done in this manner that are uh, existing in the Palace Museum, and they're absolutely beautiful. And so um, the entire team fell in love with this kind of model making, and I hope that um, we'll be able to produce uh, an entire model of the, of the uh, gardens. And here is a quick image of some of the totally refined materials from inlaid, uh, jade inlays, uh, marquetry, uh, um, paper uh, things. It's really fantastic to see what once existed and what can be restored in um, much the same way. Here are some images of some of these restorations in other parts of the, of the garden. I just think it's really very interesting to see how uh, phenomenally beautiful the, the painting is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are just some images of the spaces inside that are surprisingly 
empty and void of detail now because since 1923 um, they have been uh, left alone and barely, and we're very lucky that they're still standing and available. And that's it, finally. <laughs> Sorry to have gone on for so long, but thank you very much. So thank you for, for a wonderful, um, wonderful presentation. I, I wanted to, uh, obviously I want to make time for um, the audience to ask you some questions. So They're all thirsty. You, well, the hardcore audience okay. to ask you, for, <laughs> ask you some questions. Um, so as you think of, of those, um, I thought I would um, maybe ask you a little bit about this, um, um, this idea of working in museums, working with museums. It seems that, you know, um, and museums appear in, in Paul's book a great deal because there are these great sort of types of buildings that keep growing and also that are able to to hire really great architects. So you have a conversation among among really um, an, uh, extraordinary architects with clients that really care about what the argument is. And so I wanted to ask you, in your experience now that having worked with museums for a long time, how is the argument that museums or some museums are, are making to the public or towards the public changed or different than let's say 20 years ago? Well, I think museums like libraries um, are beginning to think that they want to bring a wider, more diverse public into inside um, and present themselves not as the prison of art but rather as as somebody who wishes to dialogue about ways of art making ways of looking at art and uh, be more interdisciplinary, I would say. Um, I think it's, of course, a little bit different in every, in every circumstance. Um, but certainly from my perspective, the idea has got to be that you bring, that you make the dignity of the visitor a prime, uh, prime factor. And that's not always easy. Sometimes, I mean, probably a lot of us experience these overcrowded uh, places where people walk around with, I don't know, that thing. Um, and, and that's the opposite of a great experience. So I don't have <laughs> a good answer, but I think the when you're working with collections and museums, um, it is all about the compassion for people in relationship to the passion for art and always architecture, obviously, um, that that sort of sets the sets the dialogue. Do you, um, one of the words that you used in your presentation. Uh, or two of the words used in the presentation was spectacle versus elegance. And you're clearly on the Did side. Did I? No way. Cle clearly on the side of elegance. You, um, and so I wanted to ask you a little bit about elegance. You know, at, on how, um, at what scale do you feel you enter into the, the question of elegance? Is it at the level of sort of form of the building and the, 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 the public facing, or is it at the level of, of detailing interiors? What <clears throat> well, I think that if architecture isn't provocative and challenging, then you're not doing enough. 
However, I also think that it would be nice to think that you don't have to hit everybody over the head with that. Um, so it's a back and forth, right, in trying to understand how do spaces relate to one another, how do you confront people in them, how do people perceive uh, themselves, and how can they receive and be challenged and provoked by, um, by the art or by the exhibits that they are. And so I haven't answered uh, you, because I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> well, maybe I can ask you in, on, that, um, on that note about staircases, which seem to be an obsession of yours. Because I, 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 I seem to... I think they're really an obsession of everybody in the office. Everybody. <laughs> but the, the staircase seems to be a place where you really focus a lot of attention, both in Clendon Park, uh, at the Frick. Um, you mentioned the staircase at the Frick as everybody has wanted to go up the staircase and now you can. <laughs> um, that is one great staircase though, you have to say. <laughs> so what is it in a staircase that really, mm, that draws you? I mean, what... what <clears throat> well, the staircase, I think, is um, the exemplified uh, monument of circulation. Mm -hmm. And it is the place that connects you vertically. And it's cumbersome to go upstairs, or it's elegant to walk downstairs, sometimes, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so, stairs are complicated. They are the thing that brings us together in a house, in a museum, in a public space. Um, and they give you a different perspective. They give you a different sense of presence of mm. yourself and allow you to relate to space. And, and they're complicated when they're not resolved. So. Ultimately, I think, I'm not obsessed with staircases, but I think staircases are a particular aspect of making space and connecting spaces that is vital to, to the functioning of, uh, of a building. And they have to be just so. <laughs> I mean, I think of the great staircases of the Opéra Garnier and so on. These are right. spaces of, these are, spec these, are spa these are staircases for spectacle. Right. Whereas I think, uh, I mean, if I, if I can see, like your, your staircases are still places to see and be seen, or? <coughs> well, you just haven't uh, given me an opportunity yet to make a really spectacular <laughs> staircase. Um, I'm not adverse to that. I, but I, I think so much of it is really the opportunity of, um, generally speaking, I, feel that architecture is for people and it becomes better when people use it um, and if they can use it flexibly and freely and without being coerced into that mm. perpetual wow moment because guess what once you've been wowed the second time you come around you say like that's pretty good i think architecture is great at any time over a long time. I know great architecture when I see it, and not because I have to exclaim. But, but there's a place for everything. And, um, and so, yes, the, I think theater is a part of it. And um, I think you point this out. It's, you know, who, who are you in that building? And how do you relate yourself to that building? Um, I think those are considerations and they're different in each circumstance. So I wanted to follow up with that in, in terms of working with old buildings because, you know, stairs are a lot of times transitions between the new and the old. There are different floor plates, so you mm. have to resolve the aesthetic of one and of the other. But also, the, you pointed out to things that you wouldn't have done, especially in the first project, you know, that you're earliest project and here you are having to deal with the old building and you're making this filigree that you're as if the building is making you do something you didn't want 
And so I'm, I'm curious about those kinds of moments in which the, um, in which the old building pushes you to do something you didn't want to do. Do you fear those moments? Do you look forward to those moments? Do you? I love those so moments <laughs> because I think that um, it and it doesn't really matter whether it's old or modern or uh, it's it creates dialogue. It creates friction. Creates uh, provocation and challenge, and um, and. Sometimes, I think, as architects, we are brought up with a certain dogma. And architectural education today is very different from the architectural education that I received. And it's interesting to see how students do that. There is um, sort of the gestural parametric design that uh, is, comes at a different uh, period. and. None of it is per se right. All of it is re related to circumstance and in, uh, in reaction or in answer to something else. Hmm. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the relationships and in the response. And I'm interested in not falling down, um, not shy. Um, but I'm also not interested in over-trumping somebody. <laughs> and, um, and so, mm -hmm. there. Um, some questions um, from the audience? Oh, some in the front row. Um, Go ahead. You said your father was an architect. You said your father was an architect. Did any of his design philosophy influence your own? Yes. <laughs> well, you can't leave your um, your upbringing behind, and um, and I think that my father, because he didn't receive an academic um, education, had a very um, intuitive response to space, and a lot of that has to do with how you move in space, what dimensions are. Um, and all of those things, I think, uh, reverberate in, in the work we do. Mm -hmm. oh. It's not too far to travel. Mm -hmm. uh, what inspired you to become an architect since you were little? Ne, you say that you were from uh, a family of architects, ne, but internally, how you felt? What, what made you take that decision to be an architect? Um, it took me a long time to want to be an architect. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't at all sure that that's what I wanted to do. Um, it certainly looked like it was a lot of work and I wasn't so keen on that. Um, it also seemed like you could never make any money and I really didn't like that. Um, but for a long time, not knowing exactly what to do, I let myself be convinced that doing some internships on construction sites and uh, in a variety of offices, I realized that what I really liked was the relationship that you had with people and with, um, with sort of so many different aspects that make our life better or interesting. And, um, and so then once I study, start, started to study architecture, I, I got into it. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at um, buildings like the Frick Collection and the Contemporary Museum of Art in La Jolla, with multiple layers of existing architecture, some of which may shout and some may be more quiet, different levels of architects that have already been there. Do you approach each one of those eras or layers the same exact way or do you sort of take each one for what it is in your 
mm. heady task of trying to create something new for these institutions. I certainly would hope the latter. Um, I think that our approach really is to know as much as you possibly can, to learn um, with the idea that the more you know, the more you know, um, but to not, not blind yourself to your own intuition or your, or your own experience and to sort of have um, a constant dialogue to the two. Gunnar Asplund um, never allowed people in his office to look at the drawings from previous projects. And I always thought that that was such an interesting thing because it meant that every time when you do something, you have to reconsider the context and um, make sure that you never do anything formulaic, but always uh, strive for the specific. And I think that's kind of how we're trying to do things. You have collaborated with so many different kinds of institutions and museums. Um, I want to ask a question that, um, you know, Hauser Wirth and David Swerner, they are commercial galleries which are kind of different from the museum because they, they somehow they have to sell the art. So will this um, commercial goal affect the architecture or affect your collaboration with the client? Um, yeah, of course. Everything, I think really specificity is, is some part of it. In a commercial art gallery, the light levels are way less important. In fact, you want people to really see the art. Um, in a museum, you don't want them to see the art. You keep it really dark. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, <laughs> but the, it's not so much about whether it's commercial, but it's, are you making good space that serves its purpose? And I don't think that our thinking about the space in the recycling facility in, in Brooklyn um, is different than how I think about space at the Frick. Having said that, I'm not getting the two confused. <laughs> They are doing very different things. And so, again, I think what you try to do is you try to really understand what is the problem and how do you deal with it and how do people fit into it or um, what, are the, what are the practical realities. Richard, over here. First of all, congratulations on an uh, uh, exquisite body of work. Um, I have a question about how so much of your work is involved with um, uh, historic buildings. How do you discern between how referential your design um, attitude might be or how contemporary? And what are the factors to uh, uh, result in a design which is on one end or the other a continuum? I think that's an excellent question because I think uh, what you're pointing out is I'm not a preservationist. I'm an architect, I'm a modern architect and um, the reason why we are often confronted with projects like that because they are not in the first place about preservation or restoration, however much respect I obviously have for that. Um, but I think that we are often entrusted with projects that where the purpose and the logic is a very important part. And so when you think about what is a building's new purpose, for example, uh, you kind of, again, put yourself into the place where you're trying to understand how people come together, how they move, how much room they need. And, um, and so it's not about being reverential to the building, but about understanding what, 
for lack of a better term, what constitutes quality. And, and so I think it includes respect. It includes ideas about dignity and, um, and coherence maybe, um, and, and a certain amount of humility to the sort of larger purpose. I really do believe that it's better if you can give buildings a new purpose, if that's possible. Um, and I'm sure that many of you who are architects here walk around and look at buildings and you see them in the way in which you would like to see them. You sort of make changes to the windows and, <laughs> and maybe sort of repaint the, right. the exterior. And so it's a little bit like that. It's like you're practical about it. Does that make sense? A little bit of both. <laughs> and last question, perhaps. Um, well, oh, there we go. I want to go back to that first image of Cologne because one of the striking things going to any big West German city from the 60s onwards was that you'd see a big neon Mercedes sign, and then in the square by the cathedral, you'd see more neon signs for. Agfa and for various 47 other... 11. Exactly. Could you talk a little bit about your battles over signage and even branding? Because there's something very striking about what you've shown us today that there's only one project where you see a sign and that's the refectoire. <laughs> in fact, that's not there <laughs> yet, as, uh, as far as I know. And I think this is really significant. It seems like a minor issue, but to be able to make projects where you can avoid, um, or you can retain a kind of dignity to a building, and also the experience of the visitor by, by, um, by the way they approach and arrive at something and begin to enter. Well, I guess <clears throat> I sometimes think that that is um, signage of its own. Uh, I haven't really thought about signage per se, but I do remember that you and I had a conversation about signage in Arl, and I remember, we'll never forget you saying, I don't want any of that signage that's in great taste, that's so tiny that you can't see it. And um, <laughs> so I've stepped back from that curb and thought maybe I let other people deal with that. Um, no, but I, I, I think it's, it's a complicated one. I think that, um, for example, in, in uh, San Diego, people had a very difficult time finding the entrance. And so somebody put signage into place so that they would find the entrance. To me, that was too bad because you had to add something in a place where I would rather see less. Generally speaking, I prefer less. Um, if I can, if you intuitively find um, the entrance, admittedly in our building, you can't overlook it. Um, mm. But but I think it, there, there has to be a balance to things. And of course now in, in uh, Los Angeles there is a big debate about the Encyclopedic Museum where no piece of art needs any signage whatsoever because you don't need to know. You just need to look at that beautiful piece of art and that should be enough. Well, I think that's a bit silly. Um, but yeah, so I think it's a debate. I think there can be extraordinarily beautiful signage and um, Lucky Strike is one of the best branded uh, things I can think of um, to be continued. Well, um, Everybody go home now, please. Yes, <laughs> th thank, thank you for a magnificent lecture. Thank you.